there's a story that the Buddha told one time about an acrobat and his assistant. The assistant's name was Frying Pan. And the story goes that the acrobat set up a bamboo pole and said, okay, I'll get up and stand on top of the pole. And then he said to his assistant, so you just go up and climb up on my shoulders. I'll look out after you and you look out after me and that way we'll be able to perform our tricks and then come down safely from the bamboo pole. And then she said, no, that's not going to work out at all. I have to look out after myself, you look out after yourself. In other words, I'll maintain my sense of balance, you maintain your sense of balance. And that way we'll be able to perform our tricks and come down safely from the bamboo pole. And the Buddha commented, in that case it was the assistant who was right. And then he used this as an example of how when you look after yourself in the practice, you're also looking out after others. And then he went on to say, also when you look out after others, you're looking out after yourself. In other words, as he saw it, when you really look after your true well-being and welfare, it's not taking anything away from anyone else, it's actually helping them. And when you look out after their true welfare, you're not taking anything away from yourself. In this way, he didn't see any clear-cut line between your own well-being and the well-being of the people around you. It's important to keep this story in mind as you take the practice out into your normal daily life. Because as you develop the qualities we're working on, mindfulness, alertness, concentration, discernment, tranquility and insight, you find that you become a steadier person. Your mind has a good grounding and has a good home. You're not so open to influences from outside, especially negative influences. And this way you develop a greater solidity. And this solidity is in and of itself a gift to the people around you. I recently saw an old New Yorker cartoon, a very chaotic office. And there was one person in the middle of the office who seemed calm. And the boss was talking to one of the workers. He says, George over there, he said, it's a center of calm in the midst of chaos. Get rid of him. <laughs> but we don't have to think that way. If you can be a center of calm in the midst of chaos, it really is a gift to other people whether they appreciate it right away or not, eventually they will appreciate it. And it is a gift. So as you're working with your breath, realize that your ability to stay with the breath, be grounded in the breath, develop a friendly relationship with the breath, is a gift not only to yourself, but also to the people around you. Not only that, as you develop a good relationship with yourself inside, it's going to spill out to other people. I heard a group of people one time discussing how they felt about the, the idea of goodwill or the idea of equanimity. And of course the idea in the abstract can get kind of intimidating. How can you have goodwill for everybody? How can you have equanimity in the midst of all situations? Is it something really worth having? And the Buddha's solution to that was that not to deal with ideas, but actually to imbue your relationship to the breath with these qualities. Be friendly with the breath when the breath isn't going well. Have compassion for it. When it is going well, appreciate it. When it gets to a point that you can't do anything about it, develop a sense of equanimity towards it. And when you develop these relationships inside, they're going to spill out to the way you relate to the people around you. If you have a chaotic or abusive relationship inside your mind, that's going to spill out too. So look after the inside. And the quality of your inner relationship is going to affect all your relationships in every aspect of your life. So try to stay in touch with the breath. Appreciate the quality of the breathing. Try to sensitize yourself to that because for so much of our lives we learn to desensitize ourselves to what's going on in the breath because there seem to be so many other things outside that are much more important. But this is your foundation, this is your basis, this is your grounding. If you learn to be at ease with the breath, sensitive to the breath so you know what's going on in the mind, because the breath does mirror the events in the mind. 
that puts you a lot more in touch with what's going on inside. Thoughts, emotions will show up in the breath. And then you can, use, you can use the skills we've been talking about here, learning to breathe through attention, finding the parts that are comfortable, letting those comfortable sensations spread. This gives you a sense of nourishment throughout the day, a sense of strength. So this is one of the ways in which, by, by your maintaining your sense of balance, you help other people maintain their sense of balance as well. And it gives you the strength to develop other good qualities in your relationships, too. Several of the questions that were addressed focused on the issue of the dharma of relationship or relationship as a path. And although the Buddha never said that it was equivalent to the path of meditation, you can't just meditate and hope that it's going to straighten out your life. You have to work on developing certain qualities in your relationships to create a sense of, of mutual respect, mutual support, mutual caring. And sometimes the ideal qualities are place a lot of demands on you, but if you've developed that inner strength from having a good foundation inside, it's a lot easier to develop the qualities. There's a list of four that the Buddha recommended. The first is generosity, giving. Be generous with your time, be generous with your forgiveness. Be generous with your knowledge. Although at the same time you should have a sense of time and place. I was once thinking of writing a humorous piece on how you can use Buddhism to ruin your marriage. Honey, would you be a bodhisattva and take out the garbage for me? Or, Stop being angry. Let go of your anger. <laughs> Making yourself the teacher of the other person. They're going to resent that. Just as people learn to use Freud's insights and to, to ru ruin marriages, you can start using Buddhist insights to ruin marriages. Try not to do that. Try to find the right time and place. That comes in under the next one, which the Pali term is kind speech, endearing speech. Now this just doesn't mean sweet, sweet words, but it also means being very careful about how you talk to the other person. If you have something negative, something critical to say, find the right time, find the right place. Find the right words to express what you have to say. So that it really is helpful criticism. And they have a sense of your respect for them because you are careful about the time and the place, the appropriateness of your remarks. And at the same time, when you have positive things, things to say, don't be embarrassed about saying the positive things. The third quality is when you're helpful to someone else, really help them in ways that are genuinely helpful. Not just going through the motions, not being helpful for the sake of scoring points so that you can make a trade. And it's, look, what does that other person really need? And provide what help you can. So that the help you give really is something that's appreciated. Appreciated. The fourth quality is consistency. In other words, the way you behave in front of that person's face is the way you behave behind his or her back. And vice versa. There's a consistency to your behavior, which becomes a foundation for trust. So generosity, kind words, Genuine help and consistency. These are the qualities that make for a good relationship. A relationship where it's easier and easier to, for both parties to practice the Dharma. Another way that you can be of help to the people around you is when people are sick, people are dying. You can be a solid presence, a steady presence. There's a story in the suttas where a husband and wife, the husband is, seems to be on his deathbed. 
And then his wife goes in to console him, and her way of consoling him is one, is she says, don't worry about me, I'll be okay. And then she points out in various ways that she is, it turns out that she's a stream in her. And so there's no way that she's going to abandon the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha. And as she says over and over, as she points out various ways that she, he should put his mind at ease, she says, she says, the Buddha says that it's not healthy to be worried at death. So she said everything she could to console him and to give him a sense of confidence. Turned out that he didn't die, he recovered from his disease. So he goes and tells the Buddha about what his wife said. And he said, you're really lucky you have a wife who's so wise. So this is a gift you can give to people as they're going through difficult times, is your steadiness. And if you can teach some of these techniques, dealing with the breath to someone who's sick, and I found that there are cases when you can. You can't, have, it can't happen all the time. But some people are receptive, some people are ready. You give them something to hold on to. But again, you have to be very sensitive to what that person needs and what that person is capable of understanding. I knew a Dharma teacher who was telling me that when his mother was dying, he was beside her bed, holding her hand and telling her, okay, you don't have to worry about, you don't have to hang on to things, you don't have to be attached to things. Feel free to let go. And the more he said let go, the more she held on tightly to his hand, gripped his hand tightly. And it was only said, okay, we love you, we love you, we love you. And then she finally relaxed. So have a sense of what teachings are appropriate. And if the person is in a situation where they won't, cannot accept the teachings or cannot understand them, can't use them, okay, at the very least, make sure that you have a solid presence, you provide a solid presence. And it's this way, again, that by maintaining your balance, you have other people maintain their balance as well. And on the top of that is you develop an attitude of the attitude of goodwill, compassion, appreciation, and equanimity. You're putting good energy into the world as a whole. So when you dedicate thoughts of goodwill to other people, I've known of circumstances where people actually can pick up the fact that somebody is wishing them well. Now, there is a current that goes from the mind. So try to put that positive energy into your life, put it into the world around you. And this way your practice is a gift, both to yourself and to everybody else. As the Buddha once said, all things come from the mind. So the fact that you have a mind, and the word to use mind here can also mean heart. All things come from the heart and mind. Okay, you have a source right here. It's like a radio transmitter sending out messages, sending out energy into the world. So if you keep this source in good shape, the energy it sends out will be good energy. And that type of goodness is never lost.